So I was brought up in class uh, just the other day that we haven't really covered Russia yet. And the question is, why haven't we looked at Russia? Is it just not there? Does College Board not care about it? Mm, not quite. Uh, here's Russia, right? And uh, so the big reason we have not talked much about Russia so far is kind of because where it is. You go back to 1648 and, and previous to that. Russia is way off here on the edge of, well, civilization. I mean, and uh, a lot of people question, is Russia European history or not? Well, most of Russia is in Asia here, uh, out east of the Ural Mountains, you find right here. But most Russian people actually live here on the North European plain. And so, yes, Russia is definitely considered part of Russian history. Uh, but at the time we're talking about from the 1400s up to the 1700s, uh, Russia is considered a very, very backwards place. It's kind of um, left behind as Europe has moved forward. Uh, biggest problem is that it was a big piece of land. It was not united. There are tons of different people that live there. Um, there are Muscovites who were ruling Moscow. There were Slavs around the city of Kiev, Tartars in southern parts and, and eastern parts of Russia. Uh, Tartars were the old Mongols. Um, all different types of peoples, ethnic groups, nationalities, languages, and religions were present in Russia. And none of them were united. It is such a big country. Even yet today, there are over 100 different languages and cultural groups that exist in Russia. Uh, and so because they could not unite them, it wasn't you know really all together yet. In fact, the Soviet Union will try to unite Russia and fail miserably. Top it off, they didn't have a lot of contact with the West. They had no warm water ports. The only ports that were available to them were on the northern Arctic Sea. And so they were, um, or the ocean, excuse me, and they were uh, actually iced over most of the year. All the nearby ports were held by other countries. So the Swedes under uh, Gustavus Adolphus had taken over much of the North Sea, uh, the Baltic Sea as well. Uh, the Polish government held parts of Moscow. The Black Sea was held by the Tartars. And so really, there was much going on. There were people who owned land in Russia. They're called the Boyers. They're basically this very, very weak nobility. Um, they held a lot of the peasants in a very old school feudal-like system. I think Middle Ages Europe, but, you know, in Russia, pretty much. And so they're really kind of behind on how things are supposed to work. And to top it off, as we see all these new inventions and science technology come up, they really aren't there in, you know, Russia yet. As uh, Europeans are doing a lot of stuff like examining the stars and medicine, that kind of stuff, the writing is in Cyrillic and the clocks are not, well, existing. And they used abacuses and they had a whole Russian calendar that was all their own. And people really believed in a lot of superstition. And superstition was huge yet. There was like no science whatsoever. Uh, the church held everything that was held in, had in Constantinople. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church had split from the Catholic Church uh, back in 1054 AD. And so there wasn't a lot of people going back and forth between the two churches at all either. So really, this is why Russia is lagging behind everybody else. That is up until this man here, Ivan, Ivan the First, or Ivan the Terrible, who was, quote-unquote, the Grand Duke of Muscovy. He had fought the uh, Mongols, the Tartars, around the area of Moscow, kicked him out of town, uh, and, well, took over that area of Moscow. Now, because of his um, very violent nature he was nicknamed the terrible i guess he was uh prone to these fits of rage where you get mad and just start killing people and beating people that kind of stuff uh and if you opposed him and try to get rid of him he would be very very terrible to you uh and in fact his own son one time uh enraged him and he beat his son to death with uh his uh gold top cane and uh, it was either his wife or his daughter he kicked her until uh, he made her miscarry the baby, that kind of stuff. And so he was known for his very violent actions and torture, that kind of stuff. Um, but he was known for opening trade to England. And he started seeing some of Russia communicate back and forth. Now, when he dies in 1584, uh, his second son, because he you know killed the first one, takes over. Uh, and he's very weak-minded. That's just the word that's used for this whole thing. Uh, weak of mind. He obviously has some kind of disability, what the case was. Uh, but it was this time of troubles he goes to, and Russia kind of goes down the hill for the next, uh, you know, 30 years or so until the Romanov dynasty comes forward. And here, Michael Romanov, Mikhail Romanov, um, 
and he was kind of married to, uh, related to Ivan uh, through uh, ways of marriage. And he kind of saw the troubles in Poland and how other countries were struggling uh, that didn't have a very centralized monarchical system. And so he started kind of shifting everything towards a more clear monarchy and getting the control of the nobles. And so some people were okay with this and went along with it, especially nobles. Uh, serfdom was still very much kept in Russia. And in fact, you were tied to the land for life. And once you owned a piece of land, you were stuck there. And uh, you worked on some nobles' land. And in fact, if you ran away, you could be 15 years later that you're brought back uh, and sold almost like exactly slavery. And so really, you see this, uh, you know, very high up, you know, monarch noble system in, in Russia. You also see tons of peasants who are stuck there as well. Um, those who opposed the Romanovs got in a lot of trouble. And in 1667, uh, Stenkara Razin, a Cossack, a Cossack is a group of people that live in, in southern Russia, um, got a whole fleet of ships and they declared war on Russia and Persia and the Black Sea. They looted and captured and plundered all kinds of stuff. And when they when they eventually you know captured, uh, they were tortured and put to death to show, show that this monarch will not be messed with. Now, a couple of generations after uh, Michael uh, in the Romanov line came Peter the Great. And Peter the Great comes into the world in the 1700s, uh, 16, late 1600s, 1700s, where uh, there are two types of people in Russia. There are reformers who will become more like Western Europe, and there are the old believers who want to stay, have Russia stay just like it is now. And so, and uh, Peter the Great is definitely one of those reformers and wants to see Russia change. A lot of times the traditional people are these Strelsky, these, these Russian professional soldiers, very old school Russians who want to, who have at different times tried to take over the government. Well, his father dies at 10 and uh, his sister tries taking over, but she doesn't do very well. She has all these rebellions, all that kind of stuff going on. And at 10 years old, he was ruling with his brother. Uh, now, probably with his brothers, his brother had uh, really severe disabilities, I guess, uh, both the mental and physical disabilities, uh, died shortly after. And then, ta-da, Peter the Great is Tsar and Emperor of Russia. Now, before he's the Emperor of Russia, he spends a lot of his time living uh, in Germany as his mother rules his regent. And so in Germany, being Prussia, right, he learns how to become a soldier. And he, uh, you know, lives in the barracks, learns how to soldier, all that kind of stuff, and in fact, his uh, servants would fight live war games for him in the backyard, him being general. They're shooting live ammunition at each other, shooting cannons at each other, all that kind of stuff, almost like his own little living chess set. Now, Peter the Great was an interesting dude. He was about 6'8", which you think would be, boom, big imposing guy, as you see here in the uh, in that painting, right? Yeah, not quite. He was actually very, very thin, very, very, like... Uh, uh, narrow, not imposing. He had some other disabilities going on. I guess he had this weird facial tick, maybe some Tourette's going on with it. Uh, he was epileptic, had constant seizures. But when he was uh, you know, around two, he was also very, they call him loudmouth, violent, and ruthless. And he could be, uh, he, he had no problem punishing anybody who uh, stepped in his way, including his own family members on numerous occasions. Now, when he's still young yet and just becomes uh, the czar, he uh, t does what's called a grand embassy, where he goes on this incognito tour. They all lose him, right? Uh, with hundreds of people to tour England and Holland and France, go all over the place pretty much. And uh, Europe doesn't really care. Like, oh, it's Russia. Whatever. They're more freaking out about, you know, France and the Spanish secession and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Peter there goes and learns all these different things in different places. He chills in Holland and learns how to build ships. In fact, the, the Dutch build a ship called the Peter and Paul in his, in his honor that he helped work on. He learned how to design ships and build ships and kind of creates the idea for a Russian Navy. Uh, he hangs out in London, learns how to build cities, which would be, which be he'll base St. Petersburg off of. He learns science, education, all that kind of cool stuff. And he has paintings made, like the painting in the previous slide here was done by an English painter and given to the royalty as a, as a gift. He learned how to draw and catch butterflies, all that kind of cool stuff. While he's chilling out there, we get the message that the Strelsky, the professional soldiers, um, and uh, his half-sister are actually trying to take over the government. And so he comes back, kicks everybody out, puts his half-sister in the convent, makes her become a nun for the rest of her life, and tortures and executes 1,200 other rebels in the most grotesque of fashions ever. Um, does not mess around. And he, when he gets back there, he says stay, and starts changing things, especially the military. Uh, Pre-Peter, uh, the military was an amateur system, almost like feudal knights, right? The nobles would bring their peasants with them. He'd be in charge of them, and it would just be kind of a messed up situation. 
Peter brought in that common training you see in the Western military's lifelong service. Once you're a soldier, always a soldier. And like Louis, he would go through the peasantry and just kind of pick up all the people he can. I also had elite units like cavalry and that kind of stuff led by the nobles and eventually one of the bigger armies in Europe at 130,000 men. Now, granted, not big compared to the people he had, but still a very, very big army. You know, he starts with a navy of zero ships. and By the end, he creates and designs his own warships and has 850 ships based out of out of uh, of Russia. And uh, by the end here, he starts fighting a bunch of wars. And his first wars are against the Ottomans in the south here. The whole goal is to gain the warm water port here on the Black Sea. Well, he doesn't get it. He gets close, but doesn't quite get it yet. Um, and and then, uh, and But gets right here, the access. See right there where we're at looking at? A little bit of access right to the Black Sea. Once all of it, but only gets that little part. Once he gets a little bit of access to the Black Sea, then he does what's called the Great Northern War, where he attacks the Swedes, hoping to get access to the Baltic uh, the Baltic Sea, and he does. In fact, he kind of goes into, into Sweden. He kind of lures the Swedes into Russia and then uses the Russian winter as a way to um, almost, like, knock out the entire Swedish army, invade, take over, all that kind of stuff. Uh, also takes over parts of Pomerania, expands into Poland, and really enlarges the Russian Empire by, you know, quite a bit uh, as, as, as he takes over certain parts. Um Kind of a big deal, you know what I mean, as, as Russia is expanding. Now, he also changes a few things within Russia as well. And one of the things is uh, looking at, at at rulers is he takes care of the church. And typically, the Russian Orthodox Church had a bishop who was in charge and worked separately from the monarchy. Well, he says, screw that. He puts his own dude in charge and says, you'll now work for the state. Uh, basically, all the monks were paid a salary. They worked for the state. And whatever Peter said, went. He started public schools for, for, pe for people to go to. Uh, this way, he would learn things like navigation and math, uh, engineering and science, so that when he had so, uh, sailors on uh, naval ships, they could navigate, uh, new engineers to design ships and weapons. Um, also, science and engineering is very important because educated soldiers need to fight. If you're going to have artillery, if you're going to calculate angles and all that kind of stuff, figure out uh, how, to, how to have the best resources and have uh, educated officers to run your military. He also started... Uh, got very controversially, he started getting rid of Western, uh, of Russian traditions. To be Russians wore big long robes, big long beards, they, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. They drank vodka, all that kind of stuff. And he started getting rid of that. And he started bringing more, encouraged people to dress and act more like the French in a way. He brought in Euro uh, Western European style clothes, French style clothes. He forced people to actually shave their beards. I would be very, very sad. In fact, there's a beard tax that was imposed upon the nobility that if you want to keep your beard, that was fine. But there was a beard tax, so, you know, no beards. Instead of uh, drinking vodka and that kind of stuff, he'd have tea parties and little social gatherings. Uh, he also took the industry and made it state-run, almost like a mercantilist-type system where he encouraged uh, the building of military and luxury goods to make that happen. Now, one thing he didn't touch, and most of his people are, are farmers, is agriculture and didn't worry about that at all. He was worried about focusing on making a bigger army and making Russia a great place. And he started taxing everybody very, very heavily and putting all that money to the military. Well, eventually it's going to fall apart on him. He even tried fixing the government and tried making it so he could kind of make a bureaucracy, if you will. He was an autocrat working out of St. Peter's where he had all control, but he let the local things, local things, provinces, their own deal. He controlled the central government with 40 departments answering right to him. Uh, he built all of these beautiful palaces and fortresses all over Russia. He could stay in and live in and try to be. Now, this couple of your reading guys should give, give you a nice little overview of Peter the Great. Uh, please read to think about if he was all that great or not as we talk about him in class. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen, and may you have a wonderful day.